Psalms. We're still here. We're liable to be here until I'm old and gray. Um, that's today, by the way. We are, if I can flip over here to it, we are in Psalm 25 today. Psalm 25 is not given any kind of provin- provenance in the um, above the above the text. There, it just says that it's a Psalm of David. Although, um, uh, in my limited amount of uh, of research, uh, Charles Spurgeon said that it probably took place th- that he wrote this later in life because there is a, a verse that we will get to that references the sins of his youth. Um, so he's obviously looking back at some point in his in his lifetime, and and also there is there there is theories that maybe this took this this psalm was written around when Absalom rebelled, um, and he was running from him. Now uh, David ended up doing quite a bit of running throughout his life, and some of the uh, some of the most well-known psalms that we have take place because David was in distress. Psalm 25 reads very much like a prayer. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of music, there's a lot of poetry that could be set to music that's in the psalm, but Psalms 25 uh, reads a lot like a prayer of uplifting. It is it is a good model for us to look at in that there is uh, the uh, request, there are requests made, there, are, there, is, there is remembrances of promises made, and, and reminding God of promises too. And then uh, the, the trust in the benefits of the prayer is all kind of summarized within the 25th Psalm. So we'll begin uh, in the first verse. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul, O oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Shew me thy paths, O Lord. Teach, uh, shew me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. It opens up with a recognition of God as supreme, and and referring, and I think we've made this, and I'm not going to go through it again. We've made this, but using the term Lord is a very uh, medieval and even uh, and even ancient idea of placing yourself not only them so far above you and in rule over you but trusting them to take care of you. Using the term Lord is very, very important. It implies certain responsibilities of you, and it in, in the use of the word Lord implies very, certain very specific responsibilities of that Lord. And he says, I, I, I'm going to lift up my soul to you. He is, he is going, to, he's going to bear all. And he says, Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let, not my, let, let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies tri- triumph over me. Now, he is now uh, letting God know that as I'm making requests, I'm placing full and complete confidence in your power, and don't, don't let me down while I'm doing that. Don't let, don't let me be... Um, don't let my enemies see me fall as I stand here Waiting on you. Now, we, 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 when we throw ourselves upon the mercy of God, we often, and this, I think there's a lot, of, lot about patience you can find within the chat, we often expect an immediate. We, we, we live in an instantaneous world. You want to know the answer to a question? Google it. Within 15 seconds, if you're, depending on how fast you can type, you can know the answer to your question. We, you can throw a burrito in a microwave and in two minutes have a, a meal, we'll call it. Um, we have, we can, you can, um, you can go to the store and buy water bottled, clean, ready to go, uh, drinkable and cold, right there for you. 
We live, in an, we live in a day and age where everything just comes at us so quick. And, and, and even I was conversing with a man at the barbershop, and we were, we were talking about how much we hated Walmart, and then also how much um, the, um, well, and, and how much I use Amazon. And I said, there's, I'm, I'm at a, of an age now where there's basically nothing that I don't mind waiting two days for, <laughs> I'm, I, I, just to avoid crowds and stores and everything else. And he says, oh, I can't wait two days. And, and I said, well, you know, there's there's certain things that if I had to have it, I'd go for. But but we, we, we do live in that time. We're, we're two days. Think about it. 48 hours is too long to wait for something. We, we live in this time. And, and David's saying, I'm putting my trust in thee. And everything that, that happens, I'm expecting you to take care of it, obviously in God's time, but in a timely enough manner where God doesn't, where the enemies of God do not gain at least a um, a temporary victory, uh, you know um, Moses when he was in the wilderness, God said, "I'm going to just kill all the Israelites because they're awful," uh, and Moses says, "Well, that I feel like that would be a bad idea, Lord, because it's you know it's going to look like we led them up just to die in the wilderness." And that's what he's talking about here. He says, let not my enemies triumph over me. Let's, let's not be ashamed for what we've done here. Uh, uh, God, I understand your wrath. I understand your righteous indignation. This is, but this is a place where we need you to intervene, and we're trusting you to intervene. Now, tr- now trust, this is, this is a, he says, I trust in thee. This is, this is a part of it that, that, we, that we lose more often than not is because we don't really like to leave things in the hand of God. It's hard to have a situation to say, I'm going to leave it in front of God and then literally turn around and leave it with God. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. We sing that song. It's like, well, uh, well often what we do is we lug our burdens into church. We set them at, we have a good service. We get to converse with people. And at the end of the day, huh, <clears throat> well, see you all next week. <laughs> and here we go again. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without a cause. Now, he is pointing out, first of all, the waiting, which we already discussed, but then these, let them be ashamed which transgress without a cause. He's talking about lost people, mostly, that, and we're fixing to talk, uh, the verses that proceed start talking about paths and leading and all this stuff, and he, he's talking about lost people who just do things like, a, like rabid dogs. They have no goal. Why does a dog chase a car? What's he going to do when he gets a hold of it? Why do, why do, uh, why, why, why do, why do sinners uh, do things that destroy their bodies. Sexually transmitted diseases, uh, poisons that they, in, that they ingest into their systems, uh, 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 life, def- uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 death-defying acts just to tempt the hand of God. And, and all of these can lead to calamitous ends. You can see them. You, all you have to do is turn on your news and you can see pl- at least one story of somebody that did something real stupid. Why do they do these? It's because they do things without a cause. They have no guidance. They have no lead. And David's fixing to uh, point out a very clear delineation between the people of God, those that trust and those that wait, and everybody else. The lost are a lot of times in the New Testament compared to blind people. Blind people, shocker, can't see. And without all the trappings that they use to find their way around, you take a lost person, you spin them around in a new place they've never been in before and take their stick away from them, they're going to be in trouble. They're going to have a real hard time. Now, a lot of older blind people will have learned how to deal with that situation because they've probably been in something like that before. But you take a young, someone who's newly blind or a young person that's blind, do that to them, they will stumble around, they'll hit furniture, they'll just, they'll just amb- because blind people can't see. They don't see the dangers around them, they just move. And lost people are the same way. Why do lo- it's, it's unfathomable sometimes the things that lost people get involved with. And so why are they doing that? They, they, they don't see. They have no guidance. 
The Bible says that it's a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But with the, the my that's talking about there was David, and David was a saved person. A lost person picks up this book, and all they see is a confusing set of stories that may or may not conflict with their worldview. They don't know. And then David, in verse 4, starts, Shew me thy ways, O Lord, teach me my path. Now, this is the difference. Lost people have a re I mean, not lost people, saved people have a resource. We have the Holy Spirit guiding us. We have the Word of God as a, as a, as a very, very highly detailed roadmap of everything, that we, of everything and every situation that we need here. Lead me in thy truth. And teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day long. Now, David, again, to bring this back to where we're talking about prayer, David is calling upon the Lord to show me thy ways, teach me thy paths, and lead me in thy truth. My dad and brother Junior, and I remember to a certain degree, but uh, I was, you know, and, and mamma and mom and some of the people that were there, I a little bit, because, but I was like nine at the time. But we remember when, when, when Brother Downs brought to y'all the doctrine of election, whole new thing. Did you just jump up for joy the first time you heard, or you heard it? Were you just kicking your heels and thinking, whoo, that was the best sermon I've ever heard? Uh, from what from the stories that I've heard in my delicate remembrance, there was probably a lot of people that we need to throw this guy out of here. What are you doing? What are you talking about? But you chewed on it. You thought about it. You read on it. You studied on it. You prayed on it. And you learned. You came around to a truth that while abhorrent to the flesh, sung and toned with your with your spirit in perfect harmony, like hitting a, th a three-note chord. It just lined up. But that required patience. And so when he says, lead me, in the, uh, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation, on thee do I wait all the day. Things are not just going to come to you. Thing, uh, studying Scripture takes a lifetime. And the oldest person in this room that has studied the Scriptures all their life will probably wake up in the morning and find something new should they look for it. Right. It takes patience. It takes, it, takes, it takes thought. It takes effort. And David says, I don't want to live like everyone else that just gambles about and does crazy stuff all the time. I want to be led. Don't let me... You know, be like a a, a, a a pinball in a in an arcade machine that bounces from side to side up and down the broad way of life. Lead me on that narrow, rocky, hard, difficult path. And when I don't know where to go, when I lose track of the path of where it's at, I'm going to sit and wait until you show me where to go again. I'm going to wait for you to lead me and say, hey, this is the ministry that I am guiding you toward. I'm pulling you in this direction and I'm going to keep you there. And sometimes that takes time. I always say, whatever, if, 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 you're, if you're a member of the Lord's church, you need to be doing something. But as I say that, I don't want you just to be doing anything. There's a difference there. Do something, but don't do anything. Because all of us have a duty. We're, we're vessels, vessels created, and I've talked about vessels in this chat. You know what? This, is not, this, this Coke can is not sufficient to carry coffee. First of all, you pour coffee in here. This metal is going to heat up, and it's going to burn your hand. Moreover, I, I really think you'd have a difficult time getting coffee in there. This is not a vessel for coffee. Now, Brother Ken has in his hand a coffee cup. It's insulated to prevent the heat from burning his hand. It's got that small little, uh, little uh, 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 sipping area to keep him from having a mouthful of boiling liquid. There's a, there's a, a removable lid in which he can place. It's a, it's a vessel designed for coffee. And just the same way, I was not designed to preach. Brother Ken was designed to preach. Brother Larry was designed to preach. I was not designed to preach. I have a mind that absorbs how to work technology together, and I can teach a little bit. I can sing on some days if my voice isn't played out. Those are the things I was designed by the Lord to do. And I'm not going to be able to do anything. Else. If I try to fit my round peg in a square hole, it's just not going to work. 
We're all made to do something. So don't just do anything. Do something. Be specific. And if you don't want to know what it is, wait. Wait for the lead of God. Because otherwise, you're going to be like uh, those that... Uh, um, the, uh, uh, those that transgress without a cause. You're going to be those people that just sort of amble about through life and just sort of bounce from here to there, and, and then they're gone again. Why? Because they have no guidance, and they have no patience to wait for guidance. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions according to thy uh, mercy. Remember me... For thy goodness sake, O Lord. David is calling to mind his past. First of all, he says, Now, Lord, remember all the good things you've done for me in life, and please forget all the horrible things I've done as a child. David is, this is one of three times in this psalm where he will bring his past and current sins and ask for the forgetfulness of the Lord. In fact, if you read, I think it was it Psalm 1, 117, 112, where it says, uh, the, as far as east from the west are our sins. Uh, that's a, a paraphrasing, but you know, it's, it's se separated, long forgotten. But Dave, David is specifically saying, remember all the good things that you've done for me, for they have ever been of old. David, and I, I, if, if this was written later in his life, David probably sailed his memory back to the first time we rolled, had him rolled on the scene when all of his brothers were being tested by Samuel to see who would be king. And Samuel looked around and he said, well, do you have any more sons? Because these guys are just not fitting the bill. And he says, well, I got David. but He's out in the field. and said, fetch me that guy. He probably remembered fighting Goliath and going up against an opposing enemy with some smooth rocks and a leather sling was probably not the weapons of warfare. In fact, Saul knew that they weren't the weapons of warfare that he needed, but he's the, it's the ones that God needed. And he calls to remember. And then he goes in further and says, Remember not the sins of my youth. Don't remember Uriah and Bathsheba. Don't remember me attempting to move the ark <laughs> in a way that, that you didn't want me to remove the ark. See, there were times in David's life where he was on the path and he was waiting for the leading of the Lord when Saul said, here, you can have my armor. I really should be wearing this out there, but you're, you can have my armor to go fight Goliath. And what, what was David's response? I have not proved these. And then he went down the brook and God showed him five smooth stones to take and he loaded them up. See, he was guided. He was being led. He wasn't just ambling about, but there were other times where he said, let's go get the Ark of the Covenant. That sounds like a great idea. And let's load it into a cart, even though there's nothing in the Scripture about transporting the Ark of the Covenant with a cart. And I'll dance, and I'll dance next. Yeah, yeah. And, I'm, I, I, and, and, and that ultimately... And that ultimately led to the... Uh, led to his destruction. And, 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 and David was... Calling to mind, saying, hey, don't, don't remember those things. Remember all the good stuff, forget all the bad. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. In spite of everything that he'd done, David said, the Lord, the Lord is still willing to show people that have done horrible, terrible things, sinners. The path of all the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, unto such as keep His covenant and His testimony. Now, along with these paths that He's hoping to be taught, that he, that He's asking to be taught, the leading that He's wanting from the Lord, He said, all of those paths will be mercy and truth. They'll be, they'll be. They didn't say they're easy, but they will be merciful and it will be correct paths. But what for those, for such as keep His covenant and his testimony. There is obligation on our part too. You can't say, Lord, please leave me on the path, and while I'm waiting for you to show me the path that you want, I'm going to go and I'm going to live just exactly as I please. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going li to live it up. But seriously, when you come up with a plan for my life, I'll be there. No, God expects a certain, a, a baseline level of service 
if he's going to lead you. You know, the, uh, it, it, in the New Testament actually calls this very um, idea of the mind, the, t- talking about uh, uh, animals. And, and guiding animals and, and whether they're easy to the easy to the uh, to be guided or not certain animals are hard to break horses are hard to break once you've got them they're you can lead them around but even then they're they're, they're skittish they're unpredictable horses are hard to break and and David says you can that you can lead me in good paths you can lead me in merciful and truthful paths you're even willing to teach me where I should be on the way even when I mess up, but I have to be willing when I feel that tug on the side to turn in the path that you want to go me to go to, that I'm not just out here, again, doing my own thing. If you hook up a horse that's never been broke to a plow, it, you're probably going to lose the plow. You might get hurt if you're on the plow, and it could kill the animal. It doesn't turn out well for anybody. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Now, he goes from, in verse 7, talking about, Remember not the sins of my, my youth. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity. This is present tense. This is, this is the here and now. And he doesn't just call it, Oh, these are bad things I've done. He, he says, For it is Great. Now, if this was penned during Absalom's time, I'm sure in this moment he is thinking about all the things as a parent that he could have done differently and didn't do. And all that stuff comes home to roost. You, we, we, we think of our sins in a, on a linear timeline, but God sees them as an ever-piling clump, if you will. And separate and apart the blood of Jesus, that pile just keeps getting bigger. You're born with a, with a singular sin nature, and it is upon that sin foundation, if you will, that all your other sins are piled on top of. And the heap is a stinking, rotting mass that just you just carry it with you through the entirety of your life. And David is looking and, and thinking of all the things I have done and then all the things that I'm currently doing. Look at how great a horrid thing that I've created. He doesn't ask for mercy. He doesn't ask for grace. He asks for pardon. If someone is pardoned, their sentence is done away with. They're, 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 They're no longer responsible for that stuff anymore. If, 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 if the governor pardons somebody, it's as if they have never done the thing that they said they'd done before. David is literally asking for the saving grace that we have, that we have so ready a- access to, to push all this stuff aside. He's, he's literally, literally wanting an, an everlasting coat of Jesus' blood to cover. And that, that, of course, that's exactly what it does. Um, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he shall choose. His his soul shall dwell at ease, and and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will shew them his covenant. He says, what man is is it he that feareth the Lord? We're talking about paths and being t- taught and being led the fear of the lord is the beginning of all knowledge if you ain't if you ain't scared and, and that's one thing where i get I, I differ with some people on this idea we well, shouldn't scare lost people in heaven why not being scared of your punishment by god is a real good place to start because fearing the person that can put you there that's where you start knowing stuff I don't want you to make any kind of profession based upon fear. That's not what I'm requesting. That's not what I'm asking for here. But what I am, what I am saying is that, that that healthy fear of God and His punishments and everything, when, when the kids get in trouble, you can ask my wife, 
about AJ. He, he it's hard to make sure that he knows what I'm saying, but I have done with him too. But especially with Gracie, I'll take her by the hands, and if she's lied, and I'll say, I'll say the Bible says, "Thou shalt not lie," and that's a sin. You didn't just offend me as your father. You've offended God. And that's a good place to start with a child because it lets them know that, hey, they're, I'm not just responsible to mom. I'm just not responsible to dad. I'm not responsible to the fellow people that I, my friends and, and my family. No, I'm responsible to God, the person who created me and the person that ultimately holds the key to my everlasting uh, life or everlasting damnation. And that's scary and good. Be scared. Maybe it'll make you think about your soul and, and your situation. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll, be the, it'll be that fear in which God will use to prick your heart and say, hey, you're one of mine. Fear's a good thing. What is a man that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he shall choose. The soul, his soul shall dwell at ease and his seed shall shall inherit the earth. Now, what are the benefits of going in the way that the Lord teaches you? It said it, everything's going to be gravy. You know, it says at ease. That's, that's not what he's saying. <laughs> it says it, 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 he, he didn't say your physicality was going to be at ease. He didn't say that you were just going to walk around on a bed of roses. He said your soul is going to be at ease. There is peace. Not physical peace, not not even mental peace. Everybody's, oh, I'm just so stressed out. Hey, you know, I, I must not have peace with God. It's, your mental stress has nothing to do with your spiritual, your spiritual well-being. Your mind, just like your body, is flesh, and it's sinful, and your mind doesn't like serving God any more than your, than your body does. But there is spiritual peace if you're on the path with God. There is spiritual ease. There is a when you're all alone at night and you're there with your anxiety and you're there with your worry and you're there with your fear, you can dig down deep to your soul and you'll find that your soul's like, this is gravy. We're, we're right where we need to be. The Lord's here with the Lord's right here beside of us. He's guiding us down this way. What do you have to worry about? And if and it takes mastery, I think. Your soul can impose ease upon your body. You can quiet your mind. You can find peace in your body. You can make peace with death, with pain, with suffering, with loss. If you, if your soul is aligned, if, if, if your, your goals and God's goals are right on the same run, if, if, if you're plowing in the same direction, You know, I had a cow growing up, and that cow was huge. It was way bigger than me. I know that's surprising now, but he was way bigger than me back then. I was like eight. I was scrawny. I was like AJ. I, I, you can't believe it now. I was built like AJ as a kid. Um, and that cow had both her horns still, and she could pick you up, and she'd flat toss you. That's just how she did. She did. It was a it was a 4-H project, and and. The whole thing was we were supposed to be able to lead them about. And never was it ever any easier, the cow's name was Bessie, to lead Bessie when she, when, when her and I were wanting to go the same direction together. It was never any more easier than in those moments. But if we ever disagreed about the direction where we wanted to go, conflict arose. And you're never, as a saved person, going to find life any easier than when you and God, are your goals are singularly aligned. And if you ever decide that you're going one way and he's going the other, there's going to be some conflict there. Dad tried leading Bessie one time, and it, and, 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 and it led to uh, Bessie getting some, some correction. Bessie didn't like Dad much after that. And in the same way... When God says, no, you're going this way, and we say, no, I'm not. Well, that's going to lead to some correction. That's what we refer to in the Bible as chastisement. And it shows up for each and every one of us. There's not a single one of us that hasn't experienced it. If you haven't, it's very hard for me to believe why you're not out of here and on with the Lord. <laughs> uh, because, because you've reached a level of sinless perfection that I haven't achieved yet. Um, moving on. Uh, mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, 
for I have uh, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. Now David is turning from settling his spiritual turmoil and say, okay, now me and God are, are, are aligned on the same path, but I've got a whole lot of external threats around me. I am desolate and afflicted. One of this verse is one of the ones that make people think that this was written during the time of Absalom. David, David never, except for probably when he was being chased by Saul, never faced a greater a foe than his own son. He had half the kingdom turned up against him. People liked Absalom. Why? Because Absalom was handsome and beautiful, and he was and he was he was a, he was an easy leader. Absalom. Probably would it'd be, it'd be like being you know Ab, Absalom was the youth pastor and 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 David was the elder minister that wanted the church to keep going the way that it had been going and people said you know who would be a better king than David Absalom and this vexed him it even says in verse in verse fifteen for he shall pluck my feet out of the net as everything was closing in about him he trusted God to remove these external barriers because if you're aligned with God and just like again back to the the cow example I would I think Bessie disagreed with this but I would never lead Bessie in a place where she was going to get hurt she was a champion Holstein cow I run a grand prize with her ultimately this turned out all right she was a she I, she was a valuable animal cows are very very valuable animals and we, as God's people, we're very, very valuable to Him. You know how I know that? Because He came and He died for us. Amen. If we weren't valuable to Him, He would not have done that. In fact, there are millions of people dying and going to hell every day that prove that you are more valuable than even maybe you see yourself. Because you could be one of them. And I'm never going to lead, I was never going to lead her into a thicket I was never going to lead her into a place with a lot of holes where she could break an ankle. I was never going, I was never going to uh, uh, run a rough, rough shod through Bob wire. No, I was going to take an easy path. And David realized that, okay, now that me and God's leads are in line, these physical things that I might be scared of that are real and present danger. Holes and thickets and barbed wire are present dangers for cows. Predators are that they're they're all out there. Just because just because I me and her were walking in the same direction didn't mean those things evaporated. And just because your your path is aligned with God doesn't mean that all of a sudden all the problems in your life are just going to puff disappear and hey, everything's golden and, and no. But the thing is, and David saw this He's going to pluck my feet out of the net. It doesn't matter because God's going to say, nope, we're not doing that. Nope, we're not doing that. Hey, we're going to get close to this barbed wire fence, but it's not going to hurt us. Just keep walking with me. We're getting close here, but you're not going to get scraped. You're going to come through this all right. And if we can look at those dangers dead in the eye and just say, Lord, I'm, 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 I'm driving right at this brick wall, but I'm going to trust that you're going to move it out of the way. If that's the path that you're supposed to be on, and you'll know, you know whether you're on the path that you're supposed to be on or not, there isn't a single obstacle that can stand in your way. Jericho was a mighty, powerful city. And God removed an enormous obstacle. You know, the Israelites had nothing, no siege equipment. To take Jericho, it would have taken either besiegement, which would be months of basically letting everybody on the inside starve to death, or siege equipment to break down the wall and, and, and climb over the top of them. God says, you don't need no siege equipment. We don't, even, we don't even need to wait more than a week. We're going to walk around in this thing, and when everything's all said and done, you're going to run right in over there over the top of it, and we're going we're to take this city the way that I want to take it. You don't think God won't remove no brick wall? The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Oh, bring me out of my distress. Look upon my affliction and pain. And here's the final one. And forgive all my sins. Throughout this psalm, David's reminder of his sins is ever present. It's okay for God. It's okay for us to request God's forgiveness. It's 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 good for us to request forgiveness for our sins. It's 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 a positive thing. But the guilt of your sin should never walk away from you. 
There are things to this day that I look back and think, where was, where was this, or more importantly, where was this whenever I was doing that crazy stuff? You need to, you, and that's good. It's good for you to be reminded. You know, we could talk about the school of hard knocks. Nobody wants to go through the school of hard knocks, but sometimes it's the only way you learn. The shepherd and the sheep, sheep that, is, that, that wanders off and he breaks his leg. Do you think the, the, the sheep enjoys having its leg broke? Even this, do you think the sheep enjoys being carried around after its leg has been broke? I've, I've raised sheep. I don't think they like being on somebody's shoulder. Ultimately, though, I bet that sheep doesn't wander off again. And David's, David's constantly asking forgiveness not only for past sins, but for present sins and future sins and making sure that, hey, I need to, I need to at all times because I'm eternally sinful in this flesh to make sure that I am eternally asking for forgiveness for these things and making sure that me and God are completely aligned because it doesn't, God can't stand to be around sin. And if you're just letting stuff live, He's not going to be with you. How can He teach you and guide you if He's not there? If He's not present with you? Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with a cruel hatred. Oh, keep my soul and, deli and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Now he bookends 20 with a very, very, um, very, very similar um, wording to verse 2, where he says, For I put my trust in thee. Deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me. For I wait on thee. Back to patience. Back to trust. Back to waiting. Back. Verse 22 says, Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Now this is another one of those verses that make people that study the history of the, uh, of the book think this was written about the same time as, uh, as Absalom's rebellion because it, Israel was in trouble. But we can take this and think, you know, if, if we're out of alignment... If we're walking in sin, if we're not following God in His path, if we're just doing our own thing, what effect does that have on this assembly? If I'm driving a car and i got one wheel that's shut, stuck out this way, and all the other wheels are going in the same direction, though. Oh, that, that's fine, right? Everything's 100% fine. It doesn't matter that one wheel's jutted out to the side. I think Sarah could tell us after her little accident that one wheel being jutted out to the side does not mean a car is fine. It doesn't mean that that's, it's still mechanically... Well, I still got three wheels. That doesn't mean that it's mechanically sound. It doesn't mean that when I get out on the highway, I'm going to be able to get up to 45 and maintain that 45 and my life at the same time. And the very same thing goes for us if we're just walking and gallivanting and doing our own thing and you're just that one left wheel that's running down the highway doing your own thing. That car's going to pull to the left. It's going gonna, it's gonna to detour the, the entire machine. And you think, well, a tire can't do that. Well, that, that, that's how they work. If, one, if, if I know anything about cars, I've had, I've had, I've had one bum truck in, over the last five years, and I can tell you one thing for sure. If one thing goes wrong with them, the whole thing is messed up. Because they're a system. It's just like the organs in your body. Brother Junior had his, had his surgery on his gallbladder. Gallbladder is not a huge organ. It has a, a role of functions, but somehow we can like, function without them. So that's different why we still have it. But, um, but once that gallbladder, you know, you know, that gallbladder never gave you any trouble before. But once that gallbladder gave you trouble, I bet the whole system knew about it. We're a body, we're a place, we're people. And if we're out of alignment, the whole body's out of alignment. We're all out of sync. It's going to affect the entire, entire, entire body. Psalm 25, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns? Yes, Brother Jarrett. Yeah, yeah. What was it? Um, the um, oh, I know the car you're talking about. I've seen. Yeah, it had it had one wheel in the front, and if you if you took it in corners, it, it would it would just tip over. What was the name of that car? 
Anyway, I don't know if it matters. But yeah, yeah, they're, they're huh? The reliable Robin, wasn't it? Um, it was something reliable, what was it? Uh, now I'm gonna have to look that up. It, it doesn't matter what the name of the car was. <laughs> the, the, there was a car with three wheels, and it didn't. It does not function well. It did not corner appropriately. It was like a three wheeler. <laughs> And at the very, yeah, and at the very least, the head, the person driving the car, is going to have to fight that wheel the entire way to keep it on the road, or not at all. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, uh, you know, I, 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 there's, there's probably some of that, and actually, I don't know that I brought it out. Let me see where, what verse it was in now. Um, uh, verse nine, where it says, "The meek he will guide in his in judgment, and the and the meek will he teach his way." This psalm is also all a lot about humility. And, and it, well, it starts with the very first verse. It says, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. You're, you're, you're becoming, you're becoming obese. And, and I think that is one thing that David realized, especially when your whole country is up in upheaval and you're responsible for it. And you're saying, don't let me be the reason. I'll do, I'll do whatever kind of obeisance I need to do to make sure that everybody else doesn't. Because in his youth, David had seen what could happen if, the king, if one man decided something for the nation, he went out and he numbered the people, and guess what? Lots of people died. Jared, do you have something? That's right. Yeah, you, you just can't. We can't just go out and, well, it's... We said it with humor, but I guess it, I guess it fits. We, we serve a God of order. We don't serve a God of chaos. And, and, and does that mean that we need to be stoic and, 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 and whatnot? I don't think that necessarily, that necessarily plays, but there is order to services. There is order to the way that we should, the way that we should follow. That there would not be a law set up within God's own book if order was not to be enforced. Why do they call why do you think they call them law enforcement officers? It's because there's a set of rules and these gentlemen are 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 designed to keep those rules. Anybody else? That will bring us to the end of the chapter. 26 is where we will find ourselves next week which has a whopping 12 verses. We'll be there very shortly. Have a great week. Thank you.